We don't harness our demographic dividend, but we don't fully waste it either. That's the blue line. We now need to add 1.8 million seats a year. Again, just a little bit below what China has managed for the last 10 years. This will require, at between 80,000 rupees to, to 1 lakh per seat, excluding land, it will require $3.5 billion per year. So what we're doing right now is 1.8. We need 3.5 just to keep the demographic dividend, not to become a demographic deficit. And what if we want to grow the same way China has? That will require the red line. That's a full $5 billion a year. Where is that coming from? And historically, the private sector has driven growth, which is something we're going to come to. But my question back to the government is today, why can't our blue chip conglomerates invest in scale higher education? Why can't the Tata Group build 50 scale universities all around India? It's because they cannot justify that expenditure to shareholders because they in the end have to produce a return to their shareholders. You can see in 2008 to 2011, we went from 12 and a half to some 16 million students today. And you can see that the public system has grown by about 2% a year in seats. Private colleges have grown by about 10% a year, and the private universities, which really is the magnificence of our constitution, education is a concurrent subject, and the states have largely taken it into their own hands to license private universities today, have grown on a small base, but at 40%. And we are big fans of private universities, because they meet the needs of all stakeholders. So in other words, if you are an investor, a private university allows you to scale up to a much bigger size of business, it should meet the needs of government because if the private university requires much more investment than a small AICTE college, meaning that much more accountable capital has to enter the system and capital that has to be much more patient and dependent on quality. Why do I say that? It's because a private university that scales up to eight to 10 to 12,000 students on one campus can only do that by having fairly long and patient capital to wait for returns in a university, when you start graduating your first cohorts in two years for an MBA, four years for an undergraduate program, or three years, if you don't place your students, the university project will fail. So in other words, by having a payback period beyond the first, second, and third graduation cycles, the private university means that in order for the capitalist to make money, the capitalist has to be providing quality. And again, for the student, if you take private universities in India today, you'll see that the payback period is faster than on private colleges. In other words, what you're looking at is for engineering and MBAs, this is the average across all AICTE colleges compared to all private universities in India today. You'll see that you, students get their money back faster from private universities. Why is this, you may ask? Is it because the private universities are really better? Again. I don't think it's worth getting into an argument about quality of pedagogy because you know, that is a very subjective argument in the end. What I can tell you is when we survey employers, what they like about private universities is something actually quite simple. It's convenience. If you're Mahindra and Mahindra, if you're Citibank, if you're Tata's, and you need to recruit three or 400 kids for a graduate trainee program, would you rather go around to five or six AICTE colleges in the back of beyond in Tamil Nadu, or would you rather fly into one private university which is producing a scale cohort of graduates and get them all in one place? So the employers love the convenience that private universities give them and increasingly are flocking to them for employment. Now, what's happening in the private university space is that the number of universities are increasing. So you can see the number of licenses granted on the screen by year. The problem with this is twofold. Number one, a number of private entrepreneurs in this space will begin to fail. And the reason why is it's not a build it and they will come product. It requires marketing expenditure, it requires know-how. And a lot of the entrepreneurs who are being granted licenses in this space is related to problem number two, which is the kind of many of the people who apply for university licenses, like our legacy of private AICT colleges, are exactly the kind of people who maybe shouldn't be in education but can deal in cash can effectively oil the system, so to speak, pay the bribe, get the license. These are not the sort of people who should be educating our kids. These are not the sort of people who, in fact, know how to deliver the pedagogy, and hence, many of these universities will fail. Now, I'm being simplistic here in that a lot of these universities, in the end, are very sustainable and are striving towards better quality year after year. 
And you can look at that. You can look at Amity, which has come from nowhere to being really a household name today. It does a good job of placing its students into jobs. It actually has the largest single campus MBA program in the world, which continues to grow and continues to thrive in terms of student outcomes. I would encourage each of us to measure education by outcomes. And in the case of higher education, the outcome is a job that pays back the cost of the degree in a very short period of time. And one of the, there are several criticisms that are, that are put against private education, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit. And number, the first criticism that's, labeled, that's, that's put against them is the criticism around excellence. In other words, they say, look, they're not doing enough research. The definition of a university historically has been an institution that creates, preserves, and disseminates knowledge. But that said, the Western models, or any models around the world in middle-income or higher-income countries, clearly differentiate between research universities and teaching universities. Private universities are designed to scale up the system. And so the criticism about them doing no fundamental research, well, that's something that the government should participate in because that is a long-term investment in our economy. It is not a suitable investment for, for a private equity firm or a capitalist. And this is why, for example, Cambridge has produced 79 Nobel laureates over its existence. You know, the sort of things that it does are suitable for progressing the British economy. They are not suitable for a venture capitalist or a capitalist looking for a five or 10-year return. Splitting the atom took a while before it became a commercially feasible venture. Now, the second criticism that's, labeled, that's leveled against private higher education is that of equity. What are they charging? Well, to that, there are two responses. Number one, tax them. Today, you're not taxing private higher education. Today, it exists as a not-for-profit entity. Well, I say no, treat them as for-profit entities because to survive, they have to make a profit. Tax them and turn it into a scholarship. Tax it and grow the public system. In fact, effectively tax the system because it is now participating in the private economy instead of participating in a shadow economy. The second element, the second point is around pricing. So they say, well, private universities charge a lot. Well, again, how have we managed to get the lowest and most efficient telecom system in the world? How has it become more efficient for us to access medical aid, encourage competition? The capitation fee that was being discussed earlier today by the, 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 the gentleman from the Chamber of Commerce, why does that exist? It exists because there is a supply-demand imbalance. If there is competition in the system, you don't have to pay a capitation fee. So introduce competition. It is the same vehicle by which we have superior hotels, superior telecom, better roads increasingly, better airports. Introduce competition. It's worked in every sector of our economy. It will work in this sector as well. So, you know, we've, what, we, what we've done um, is put out a series of reports on this. In fact, on your tables, there'll be a Harvard Business Review article that I co-authored recently on higher education and emerging markets. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter to get access to some of our upcoming reports. And in this presentation, I've chosen to be purposefully a little bit controversial because in the end, the data points time and time again to higher education as being the last mile, that link towards increased earnings and productivity. We keep talking about a skills economy. We know in the end that higher education is the reason why every one of you is in this room. Without it, you could not have accessed the jobs and opportunities you have today. I would strongly suggest that we not deprioritize this as India continues to grow. And what, what we posit at Parthenon is that India can learn from our neighbors around us, learn from even their mistakes, but learn from one fundamental choice that they have made, which is to allow for-profit private sector participation to grow the system. Thank you.